Okay, let me start recording. Okay, has started. Okay, it's time. So uh, I hope everyone is doing okay, uh, keeping distances um, and uh, so locked up in your wherever you are. Uh, it's great though that you can do exercising outdoors. That it's it's interesting that you know it's it's really Bay Area. I think that I have not seen anywhere elsewhere in in the world that the policy allows explicitly for outdoor activities or exercising. So uh, you should definitely enjoy that. Uh, okay, so uh, let us get started. So uh, I uh, just like the last time I prepared slides. So let me go through them. So can you see the slides? Can anyone respond? Can you see the slides? No. Not right now. Not right now? Okay, uh, why is that? Huh. Let me check once more. Okay, share. What about now? Yep, yep, all good. Okay, good, good. <clears throat> so then let's get started. So uh, uh, the <clears throat> first, some logistics. So there, there will be no classes next week because that's in the spring break. It, it, it's weird to talk about break in, in the current situation. But anyway, it's official spring break, so there are no classes. And uh, as uh, I, I warned you uh, some time ago, I did replace the homework number four uh, last night. And the part two is now about the large and limit. So that's what we discussed uh, 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 the day before yesterday. And uh, so you, you basically just go through it together with some of the new material I'm going to talk about today. So everything is supposed to be covered by lectures. So you're just uh, uh, being asked to do that yourself. And so the due date is the Monday after the spring break. So uh, uh, we, yeah, about a week, week and a half from now. And we do have discussion section as planned today at 5 p.m. And right now, I don't have any clear idea on what to do. So uh, uh, if you have any requests on what subject you want to have covered, uh, please uh, let me know. And I try to accommodate your uh, uh, needs and interests. And so if you have any idea right now, please speak up. Okay, nobody seems to have a, a clear idea at this moment. So uh, you can uh, uh, email me after the class. So think about it while you listen to lecture today and, and see if what, what, what needs to be covered by discussion section later today. All right, so uh, jumping back into the critical phenomena. So that's a diagram we talked about uh, the day before yesterday. And so we started using linear sigma model and did the exponent expansion. And it was a crazy idea trying to go all the way down to three dimensions using the epsilon expansion. And nonetheless, it did give us, uh, you know, more or less sort of reasonable answers. But you no, know, this was definitely not a way of getting convinced that the QFT really does lead to these uh, uh, interesting fixed points at, at three dimensions. And so what we started instead is to use this large n expansion. So at least we can work the QFD out exactly in the large n limit. So that's what we talked about uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 the previous lecture. So, and what we talked about is basically this corner of the large n in four dimensions where things are trivial as expected. There's nothing qualitatively different. And we also talked about this corner here, large n in two dimensions. And we did uh, see that uh, the symmetry actually is not spontaneously broken. And phi field, which was supposed to become Goldstone bosons, actually become massive. So that's what we talked about. And we'll, I just briefly summarize that uh, in a moment. And so what we'd like to do is talk about this here uh, in, in large end limit in three dimensions. So this is where, as I said, you know, we can exactly solve the system. Uh, and so, you know, you know, uh, you have full confidence on the result you're getting. And nonetheless, you do see that you get very weird. Uh, the critical uh, uh, exponents, which is very different from these uh, uh, the, the Landau theory or trivial theory. So you're going to see this explicitly, and you're also going to see uh, how the coupling constant flows into a fixed point, also very explicitly. And after that, then we talk about nonlinear sigma model, which is actually a renormalizable theory, which shares the same symmetry as a linear sigma model, but it actually captures only the degrees of freedom of the number of Goldstone bosons. And using this, we also confirm the symmetry is not broken along this line of two dimensions. 
And from there, we can uh, also do the epsilon expansion now going into a, a dimension slightly above two. And, and so this way, we can confirm that the theory again has a fixed point. So that this gives us confidence that so everywhere inside this box, you are supposed to have a fixed point. And, and then after the, that, we I try to sort of uh, wrap things up. So that's the, the, the purpose of the lecture today. So any questions about this so far? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So what we talked about is this large n limit. And uh, what we discussed is that you can count the powers of n in each of these diagrams. And this little separator uh, eventually becomes this Oblivion field. <coughs> so if I keep only phi as the degree of freedom in one p effective action, all of these diagrams need to be added together uh, to have a complete one p effective action, which looks like a totally uh, intractable things to do. But now that we have this idea of cutting this separator out, uh, then this yellow box now becomes the 1PI diagram. The original diagram isn't. Um, sorry, sorry, I don't think we can see the slides. You, you, you do not see the slides? I just see 32P. Yeah, just the cover slide, it looks like. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Stop share. Exit. Go back to Zoom. Uh, share. This is the slide. It is supposed to be sharing. There, there we go. Can... Now you can see it? Uh, it's, uh -huh. not full screen. it's not full screen, though. What's that? It's not full yeah. screen if that's what you were trying. I know, I know. So here I'm trying to make a full screen. How is that now? There we go. There we go. Strange. I, I did the same thing last time. Anyway, so now, now, now you can see the slides so we can <clears throat> use it. So uh, uh, so we talked about this uh, large n limit. The 1p effective action for phi needs to include all of these complicated diagrams. So uh, it looks like there's no way we can do it. But having realized that I can cut this separator line, that's a sigma field, then 1p diagrams are all given in terms of this uh, one loop of phi with the sigma sticking out. So these are the only diagrams we need to capture. And for this purpose, we knew exactly what we were supposed to do. So as a result, uh, the, uh, we reroute the, uh, the original Lagrangian in this form. And you are being asked to do that yourself. And so now the only interaction in this Lagrangian is the sigma phi phi interaction. And then uh, looking at the path integral over phi, the only thing you need to add then is the uh, loop of phi uh, in the presence of the sigma field. So that's this determinant. And so uh, uh, one p effective action then has this original Lagrangian at the classical level, plus this piece coming from the uh, 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 um, uh, is coming from the uh, the one loop uh, uh, um, uh, integral, and so that's something we know what to do. And in particular, it's easy to actually work this out when the sigma field is actually a constant in space time. Now I have chats. Um, I think it froze on the same slide again. Is that right? I yeah. don't know what's going on. Press F. Somebody oh. said that. Oh, oh that's not. <laughs> so it's still not progressing? It says sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Okay, I'm doing something wrong, clearly. Let me do sharing again. Play. Is this showing the slide now? It's showing yeah. the slide, but you should try moving it because it may freeze on that slide. I should try moving it. Like the moment it. you go full screen, it mm -hmm. is frozen. Hmm. But yeah, if you don't go full just... screen, it should be possible. 
Yeah, that might be the best way to go. Let's see. How's this? Can you see the slide? See the yeah. current slide. But there's an ambulance. Yeah. <laughs> I can't hear a thing. So can you see the slide now? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if it's frozen or not. Okay, let me move forward. Um, Does it works. change? It's, changing. it's working oh, now? It, 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 is, it is changing. Okay, good, good. I don't know what the problem was, but at least it looks like it's fixed now. So, what I was saying is that, uh, so this is the Lagrangian we, we wrote using this auxiliary field sigma. It's supposed to be exactly the same Lagrangian as the ON linear sigma model. And uh, uh, the, what we were supposed to do then in the large n limit is that in addition to this uh, classical Lagrangian, we integrate over phi and to get this uh, determinant uh, uh, through, through the phi loop. And uh, so if you uh, 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 capture this determinant into the exponent, then what you're supposed to add is this trace log. And uh, in particular, in the case when sigma is the space-time constant, then uh, you know what to do, and we have done this before, so we can compute it exactly what this additional piece is. Now I have more chats. Um, uh, yeah, I see the colors box, okay. Do you guys also see colors palette on top of it? Is that what you see, colors palette? Yeah. Yes, that's what we see. It's on the top right, yeah. Oh, I, I'm not seeing that. <laughs> but do you see the slide itself? Is the color palette actually blocking part of the view? No, it's fine. Uh, I think I can remove color palette. I can remove this, I think. Then, sharing it again, this, how's that now? It's perfect now. It's good? Okay, finally. <laughs> Still learning experience. So anyway, so the sigma field, in the case sigma field is just a space time constant, we can carry out this uh, calculation determinant completely, and I get this additional factor here, the sigma to the d to the half power. And, and when sigma is not space time constant, we have to actually look at the case uh, uh, later on, then there are pieces that depend on the derivatives, space time derivatives of sigma in addition to this term. So, so that's the uh, 1p effective action. So in a case when sigma is space time constant, we know exact result in the large n limit, and therefore we can look for the stationary condition of this 1p effective action to identify what the ground state uh, of the system is fully including all the quantum corrections. So that's the idea we talked about. Now, we did briefly talk about what happens in dimension four, and we did expect from the perturbative analysis before that the theory is trivial. They indeed, we can minimize this uh, the effective action with respect to sigma. This is a stationary condition, and uh, the, the phi can acquire a value when sigma vanishes. And so when sigma vanishes, this one loop correction identically vanishes. Therefore, the condition just reduces back to what we had before uh, in the, the, the perturbative analysis. And therefore, the expectation value is simply given by this negative mass squared over lambda. So there's nothing new here. And in particular, we also learned that there's no symmetry breaking when the m squared vanishes. So in a previous homework problem, I intentionally ask you to compute the one loop effective action, which does lead to this uh, 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 misleading conclusion that even when m squared vanishes, it looks like there is a symmetry breaking minimum. 
but that symmetry breaking minimum was an artifact of the one loop approximation. Uh, if you go to the renormalization group improvement of the effective potential that is uh, described in the solution set, you go to the correct conclusion that there's no symmetry breaking. So in this case, we have the exact result from the beginning, and, and you do conclude that in the, in the absence of M squared, then phi phi vanishes, so there's no symmetry breaking. So in some sense, renormalization group equation uh, improvement is already done, given that we have the, uh, the exact result. So that's the, what we have seen in the four-dimensional case. And then we just one additional topic to this. So phi to the fourth theory, as you see, is trivial. There's nothing really interesting about this. Uh, the, the, the perturbative analysis is completely okay. But if you go to a theory with multiple couplings in addition to the phi to the fourth, which is the case in the standard model, then the, 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 there can be something interesting. And in fact, many of you might have seen a news like this. So if a cosmic bubble destroys the universe, scientists not, now know when it'll happen. And so uh, what, what this is talking about in this uh, Smithsonian article is that the Higgs potential, which is the phi to the fourth theory, actually has this behavior that uh, phi to the fourth coupling lambda would actually bend around and it be eventually becomes negative at very high energies. Then potential itself also bends around and, and, and becomes uh, 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 unstable. It's not bounded from below. And so the universe can tunnel uh, from where we live now to a different minimum. And here it says, uh, at least the universe lasts for at least 10 octodecillion years. And I don't know what octodecillion is. Does anybody know? Octo is eight, so 10 to the 80, maybe? No, no, uh, Ilion is three, so uh, uh, maybe 10 to the 240 years, something like this. Seven. Yeah. Seven. Oh. Okay, anyway, so it's, it's a long time. And the reason being that uh, the, uh, the Higgs potential looks something like this in this blue. So we are living here. But the point here is that the lambda phi to fourth coupling actually runs as a function of the energy scale. So I took these pl plots from this paper, Degrassi et al., right after the discovery of the Higgs boson. And you see this black curve, uh, little lambda, that uh, uh, at the energy scale we observe the Higgs boson, this is positive. But mainly due to the impact of the, the, the top quark you cover coupling. So you compute the loop of the top quark, that's a fermion, which couples the Higgs boson by the Yukawa coupling. So it's the same kind of calculation we are doing now. You have a loop of top quark in the presence of the Higgs field outside. And that loop diagram gives you a negative contribution to the beta function. And therefore, coupling constant lambda actually starts to decrease as you go to higher energies and eventually becomes negative. So if the lambda phi to fourth coupling is negative, then you have a quartic term which is negative. So your potential looks something like this. So that's the idea that even though we're sitting here, we can tunnel to the true minimum and that's actually the first of the phase transition. So that's given in terms of a, a figure like this. So uh, uh, even though the universe today has this expectation value of Higgs, which is small on this scale, so I said zero in this uh, uh, figure. So it's uh, uh, 250 GeV. But if the, the our universe can tunnel from this minimum to that minimum, and that tunneling will produce a bubble of the Higgs actually living over here with a huge expectation value, which you can read off from this plot, which is of the order of something like 10 to 10 GeV compared to uh, 250 GeV. So in this bubble, Higgs expectation value is huge. And so the universe starts to pop up these bubbles, which is a process called nucleation. And, and each bubble then starts to actually grow because Higgs field after tunneling, oops, I'm sorry, after tunneling can actually have a, a potential which further goes down. So if the Higgs field starts to roll down this potential classically now after tunneling, so you tunnel first, that's a quantum physics, and it starts to roll down the potential classically using the equation motion, then energy density here is lower than energy density there. 
I'm sorry that clock is ticking over there. Uh, you know, this is my son's room, and, and it's not mine, but anyway, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, you can see here this. So after tunneling, Higgs field starts to roll down, and the energy density becomes smaller. So that means energy density inside is smaller than outside. That creates a pressure on the wall of the bubble, which expands this bubble. And therefore, each bubble after nucleation becomes bigger and bigger. Eventually, they meet merge, it's called the coalescence of the bubbles, and eventually the entire universe gets filled with this new phase of uh, a huge expectation value, the Higgs, and that's the end of the universe as we know it. So it is supposed to happen in whatever 10 to the 240 years or something. So uh, uh, so that's what this uh, uh, Smithsonian article was talked about. You might have seen this in, the, in other popular media, and, and so that's actually a scientific fact that if the standard model uh, is the true theory up to very high energies, which is a big assumption, but if it is, then we are living in this metastable state. And so this is the way the first order phase transition happens as described in quantum field theory. So we've been focused on this critical phenomena for the second order phase transition where correlation length diverges, system becomes scary invariant. But if you have a first order phase transition that is described in this way, that you have two degenerate states, you tunnel from one state to another, and that tunneling would lead to the formation or nucleation of these bubbles. And those bubbles would then expand, merge, coalesce, and eventually fill up the entire universe that now will be the completion of the phase transition. So somebody asked before uh, how we describe the first order phase transition, uh, and, uh, and, and this is the way to do it. So, uh, so it, the, one of the important things that people worked out in this paper is to really estimate this, uh, uh, the lifetime of the universe. Uh, and, and that requires rather precise calculations. So they had to go to two loop and threshold corrections and, and, and uh, uh, extract parameters from experimental data. Our most important parameter is the mass of the top quark, which is not easy thing to measure at the Large Hadron Collider. And also the coupling, various coupling constants, in particular, uh, what is called the strong coupling constant. But after doing all this analysis, they could tell that we are living in this metastable state. So if the top quark mass is lower, and that's not the case in the standard model, but suppose it is, then top quark color coupling to Higgs would be smaller. Therefore, the Higgs quarter coupling doesn't quite become negative. It stays barely positive, and then we will be living in stable universe. On the other hand, if the top mass were larger than observed, then the this quarter coupling becomes negative very quickly, then the tunneling rate becomes much bigger. So we would be decaying uh, in sort of a, a uh, the foreseeable future, or we must have decayed by now. So that's this instability bound band. And we are in this yellow sliver, which is metal stable. And the blow up of this uh, the rectangle is this, this, this plot over here. And, and within the experimental errors of these input parameters, like mass of the top quark and the strong coupling constant, this is one sigma ellipse, two sigma, three sigma. So you need to go all the way up to three sigma to get into the stability uh, region. So we seem to be really in this metastable state. And now somebody is giving me chats. Uh, did this put bound on the Higgs mass before the OHC? And yes, it did. Uh, so uh, we have known this instability business uh, uh, all the way since, I think, 80s. Uh, at least when I got in grad school, this has been already known. The only new input from the OHC is the mass of the Higgs boson. So using this argument, people expected the Higgs boson mass should be uh, uh, actually higher so even for the same top quark mass, if the Higgs boson mass were bigger, uh, bigger Higgs boson mass means larger quartic coupling to begin with. So you can sort of uh, avoid this fate of the universe that the top quark color coupling would start to drive the Higgs quartic coupling smaller and smaller, but it may never hit negative value. So uh, people expected, based on this argument, that Higgs boson mass would be heavier than something like 130, 140 GeV. That, that was called the stability limit on the Higgs boson mass. But uh, you know, the LHC data came out to be really strange in a, in a way that, uh, that the mass of the Higgs mass is really in this metastability region. <clears throat> 
So the nature is very uh, 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 bizarre and it has a, a, a interesting sense of humor, I guess, that it really shows this tiny, tiny sliver where the Higgs potential is actually uh, metal stable. Okay, does that answer the question, Eric? Uh, that's right. So if those of you who have watched this uh, movie called Particle Fever, uh, the, the new Markani Hamed, who was, you know, student in Berkeley, and I worked extensively with him when he was a student, uh, he shows up very prominent in the movie, and he talks about the fact that his mass of the Higgs boson 125 GB is really an oddball. And uh, we are, uh, I think that they say that we are at the fork of the road, we don't know which way to go. But in addition to uh, being at the fork, we are actually sitting on a metastable stable point. And so that's really bizarre, but that, that's the way it is, actually. And so that's one of the major outcomes from this uh, discovery that Higgs goes on. Any other questions about this? Is everything okay? All right, so I, I, I did throw in this uh, uh, topic. First of all, it's, it's kind of interesting subject to talk about, but also this is a way I could introduce how the fluid sort of phase transition should be described in quantum field theory. And if you want to know more about this, uh, you should look up the keywords like bounce action, namely that in order to compute this tunneling rate, from this metal stable minimum to a true minimum, uh, you have to com uh, go through this potential barrier and therefore it's a tunneling process. And uh, what is equivalent to WKB method in quantum mechanics is what is called the bounce action in quantum field theory. And bounce action tells you the how you can tunnel from here to there to form this bubble. And because the physics is causal, it, nothing propagates beyond the speed of light, even if the tunneling process would not happen for the entire universe all at once, it has to happen locally, that's why you have to form this bubble locally. And this formation of the bubble called nucleation can be computed using the bounce action, which corresponds to actually uh, computing the action as a saddle point in the imaginary time uh, 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 formulation and imaginary time action actually turns out to be exactly the exponent you see in WKB method and we might come back and talk about this later on uh, uh, if time allows but anyway that's the keyword you want to look for bounce action and then you can actually compute this kind of tunneling process yourself okay so that was the dimension four and we did talk about two dimension as well. So that's the same stability condition coming from this one PI effective action. So this piece here, now I need to specialize for two dimensions. And so I do uh, set D to be two minus two, two epsilon. So that gives you this pole gamma of epsilon. I expand this out in power season epsilon that gives me this familiar pole, one over epsilon minus gamma plus log four pi. And you can see that this piece uh, can be Bound, put together with the m squared parameter so that m squared now becomes a renormalized m squared and the impact of this uh, uh, the one loop piece basically gives you this logarithmic dependence on sigma and so here i argue that in order for the symmetry to break first of all the stability condition with respect to phi is sigma phi vanishing so if you want phi to not to vanish then sigma has to vanish and, and if sigma vanishes, the first term you can drop, but this last term uh, actually blows up uh, to a positive infinity. So no matter how negative m squared might be, this positive infinity wins, and therefore this plus that is always positive, then phi i phi i plus positive number can never be zero, and therefore you can never actually break the symmetry. So uh, uh, that's the, the, the consistent with the theorem we talked about, namely that in two-dimensional QFT, continuous symmetry can never be broken because the Goldstone bosons have such a uh, huge infrared fluctuation that ends up restoring the symmetry. And as a matter of fact, the phi field, which should have been the number Goldstone boson, ends up acquiring the mass squared. And that's given by this expression. And the way you can derive this is now that phi vanishes, I can set this to zero. Sigma is going to zero, uh, so I can uh, drop this. Then I can balance this negative mass squared plus this logarithmic piece. Then the sigma 
turns out to be given by this exponential form. And as you can see, for small coupling lambda, exponent becomes large. Therefore, this exponential factor is exponentially small. So compared to, let's say, mu at, at atomic scale or something, where you define your spin system, uh, and all the parameters, presumably, of the atomic scale, uh, negative m squared, and lambda also has mass dimension too. So all of these parameters are presumably defined at atomic scale. But even if these numbers are order one and comparable, e to the minus four pi already is a very small number. So uh, you can get a hierarchically small mass squared compared to the, the original energy scale of the problem, let's say atomic energy scale. So you can have a uh, exponentially large correlation length compared to the nearest neighbor interactions defined on the lattice. So this is a really actually quite a remarkable fact that by solving this non uh, linear sigma model and in the large n limit, you can find a remarkably long correlation length. It's still not infinite. That's why the symmetry is not broken. If you compute this uh, two-point correlation function of the order parameter, that does dump exponentially uh, using this mass. But because the mass is small, the correlation length is rather long. So this gives us this understanding what's going on. Namely that if you're looking rather at the local level, well, then the symmetry is sort of gets broken. The spins are sort of lined up, and they want to line up in the same direction. But because this uh, phi field is very light and fluctuates and leads to rather strong behavior in the infrared at the long distances, if you go long enough distances, the fluctuation of phi is the motion along the bottom of this potential in this wine bottle potential. And therefore, that fluctuation ends up uh, making the spins oriented in a different direction, far away from where you are. So if you look at the en entire system as a whole, there is no particular orientation of spins common to everywhere in the system. So we now have this uh, uh, physical intuition why symmetry cannot be broken in two dimensions. And that's due to the fluctuation of this phi, namely the number of Goldstone bosons. Uh, so even though you think there must be massless number of on bosons once symmetry is broken, and their fluctuations ends up restoring the symmetry. And so you can understand this fact, uh, going back to the language renormalization group equation, because the mass of phi is a physical observable, which you can measure by a, in the laboratory. So the mu uh, was a renormalization scale, so uh, dependence of mu uh, should vanish because it's an unphysical parameter, which is an unphysical parameter, how you separate the short distance physics you have integrated out versus long distance physics you are still keeping in your theory. So I'm supposed to uh, be allowed to vary mu arbitrarily at the expense of changing the physical pro uh, the parameters in Lagrangian, like m squared and lambda. And uh, you can convince yourself that lambda doesn't change in this theory. So what changes is m squared. So this is how renormalization group equation looks like. So uh, I, in order to keep physics fixed, as you change this arbitrary scale mu, then you are supposed to change m squared uh, according to this equation. And as you can see, so this equation tells you for larger mu, m squared decreases. On the other hand, for smaller mu that corresponds long distances, m squared increases. So even if you start out with a negative m squared, as you go to longer and longer distances, m squared becomes less and less negative, and eventually that crosses zero. And where it crosses zero basically sets the scale of how the mass of the phi is generated, and, and that's exactly how this uh, solution would work out. So I emphasized this the, the, uh, the day before yesterday, that this kind of expression is something you wouldn't trust if you obtain in perturbation theory because of this e to the minus one over lambda behavior. So if you do any power series expansions in lambda, then every coefficient vanishes, and, and therefore you wouldn't uh, get this kind of result at all in perturbation theory. But now that we do have this exact result, then we have confidence that this kind of exponential expression is actually right. And as you'll see later on, this kind of behavior does persist even to finite n 
uh, when you actually analyze this near two dimensions using nonlinear sigma model. So that's how we gain confidence that this result actually makes sense for not just a large n limit, but even for finite n, as we discuss later on. Okay, so this is a situation with two dimensions. So before going to three dimensions where we see these non-trivial critical behavior, any questions about two dimensions? Okay, I'm not getting any questions, so let me go to three dimensions. So what we are supposed to do is exactly the same idea. Now that we have this uh, exact 1PI effective action, uh, I can specialize this stationary condition to three dimensions. And that turns into this equation here. And as usual, we are really interested in the behavior where sigma is small, where that's the sort of the criteria where symmetry breaks or not. And so that small sigma, it turns out that the first term, which is there from the classical Lagrangian, it becomes negligible compared to the piece you are getting from this uh, uh, loop of the phi. So this loop effect becomes more important than the classical effect. And that's why typically we wouldn't trust our calculation, but because we now have this exact result, that's something we can uh, uh, trust. And then you get something rather interesting. First of all, the question whether symmetry breaks or not doesn't look very different from four dimensional or trivial case. If you have m squared negative, I can safely set sigma to zero now because it has a positive power one half. It's not logarithmic diversion. Last term goes, first term goes, you can balance the middle two terms and you get this, uh, again, the familiar expression. The symmetry does break when m squared uh, is negative. And so what this tells you is that how the magnetization turns on when t minus tc goes negative is the square root of t minus tc, that's m squared. So that defines this critical exponent beta to be one half. So, so far, everything looks the same as the Landau theory or trivial four dimensional case. So that's this behavior. But definitely there does happen something peculiar when m squared uh, goes near zero, namely near the critical point, which starts on the next slide. And so that's here when I compute the correlation length. But any questions on this slide so far? Okay, so everything so far looks sort of familiar uh, from the uh, uh, what we discussed uh, um, <clears throat> uh, several weeks ago. Now I'd like to compute the correlation length. So again, using this 1p effective action, uh, you can identify that the value of sigma basically sets the mass squared of phi, and the mass of phi gives you this exponential damping behavior. So inverse of the mass of the phi is the correlation length. So that's what we try to identify. And when you're close to TC, m squared is near zero. Sigma is also near zero. So uh, that allows us to actually uh, the drop this sigma squared term in favor of the sigma to three halves term. And then we can just go ahead and, and compute it. So then what you're supposed to do is by dropping this term over here, everything is assumed to space them constant. So this term also goes. And then you're supposed to balance this m squared sigma term and sigma three halves term. So by taking sigma derivative, this is constant. This is sigma to half power. So the sigma turns out to be square of this term. And that's this expression here. So sigma turns on as t minus tc, that's m squared, to the second power. Remember on the previous slide, the, of the, uh, so the, in the case of four dimensional case, sigma turns on as t minus tc, because you are balancing this one against that one, sigma derivative tells you linear sigma is the same as m squared, so sigma goes like m squared, therefore t minus tc is the first power. But now that this term is there, uh, it goes with the second power. Namely, the way the correlation length uh, diverges near the critical point has a different power of negative one instead of the Landau theory, which is negative one half. So that's something you can measure experimentally. You have the three dimensional system, and then you put probes into a system. Let's say you stick in two needles into a system, and then you measure how the spin are correlated by function of the distance. So you change where you stick in the needles and you change how that actually damps exponentially as you dial the temperature of the system. 
And then you can see that correlation length indeed diverges at the critical temperature, and you can plot it as a function of the temperature, then you can tell uh, with what power it diverges. And so you can tell them apart. So this is actually a real physical effect. So the Landau theory predicts that the correlation length should diverge like a negative uh, uh, a half power uh, when the temperature approaches the, uh, the critical temperature. But now we have prediction that in three-dimensional system, this power is different. So that's how non-trivial critical phenomena uh, 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 happens in this Alagian limit of three-dimensional linear sigma model. This is the first example. There are more examples to come. Anyway, any questions about this? Um. From the from from the epsilon expansion, um, we we found, we saw a new in between one and one half, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's right. So there we were stuck at the uh, stuck at the um, the dimension very close to four, and we are only slightly below it, and we extrapolated it to study what happens at the dimension three. So we are never quite sure if that extrapolation was valid. So what we end up talking about is compare this result to the numerical simulation, and that looked reasonable. And I don't remember the number. It was like a 0.6 something. I forgot. But anyway, yeah. so you know, it's going the right direction. So the, what we get in this large n limit is more or less consistent with that analysis. But now at least we can have a confidence that this is really uh, minus one instead of minus one half. And, and therefore, uh, 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 we can really believe in this idea that the system does lead to a very non-trivial behavior at the critical temperature. Is there any, um, is there any reason that uh, the critical exponents from the large N theory would bound the, the real critical exponents or be related? Um, so again, the, we have to extrapolate then from away from large and limit and compute the one over n correction to it. And I am not prepared to do this, but that's possible. Uh, you have seen this diagrammatic argument that the one over n pieces correspond to two loop diagram with one sigma exchange inside. And you can go ahead and compute that. And then you can really see how the results could change away from this large n limit, which is always suppressed by one over n. And so uh, if you go to, let's say, O3 sigma model, then the critical exponent must be nu equal one plus a correction of the order of a third, which turns out to be actually even smaller than third if you actually uh, carry that out. So uh, you can really verify that the system uh, can be extrapolated from large n limit in a systematic expansion in power series in one over n, and which turns out to be only rather small corrections, and therefore the end result is more or less the same. So that's how you actually approach this problem. Okay, thank you. Okay. So that's the first example of this uh, uh, non-trivial critical exponent. Another example is what happens at the critical temperature when you apply an external field. So let's say you apply an external magnetic field uh, that couples the magnetic moment of individual spins. So the interaction term looks something like this. And we are interested in behavior at the critical temperature. So this m squared term actually vanishes. So you ignore this term here. And again, the sigma is small. So you end up actually ignoring this sigma, sigma squared term. So the phi stationary condition is this one. Sigma stationary condition is this one. And as I just said, you can ignore this linear piece in sigma because sigma to half power is more important when sigma is small. And then you can put this, them, them together and solve it. Right? So, uh, uh, so then you find that the phi goes like a, uh, 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 the one of the fifth power of the external field. And the way you can see it is that uh, when you do not have this uh, one loop correction, sigma is phi phi. You put it right back in here, then phi phi times phi is h. And therefore, therefore phi goes like h to a third power. And so that's the Landau theory. And that's uh, uh, that will, what we will also get in a four dimensional case. But if the sigma one half power is more important, then sigma is phi phi squared, so phi to the fourth. You stick it in here, then phi to the fourth times phi is h, and therefore phi goes like h to one fifth power. 
So again, this is a very different exponent you get at the critical temperature in the presence of an external field. So this is a, another example of the non-trivial uh, critical exponent. And so you see that <clears throat> the system does behave in a very different way from what you naively expect uh, from the classical Lagrangian, which is the Landau theory. Okay, any questions about this one? All right, so now we try to understand what happens to the coupling constant. <clears throat> so we talked about this 1p effective action, and when the sigma can be regarded to be state and constant, then we could work this determinant out explicitly, and we obtain already these uh, uh, fascinating non-trivial result in the critical exponents. But now we also have to think about how to deal with the sigma uh, with a, a finite momentum. And the reason why we're interested in this is that when you want to actually understand how coupling constant behaves, and, and, and in particular to see what it means to have this infrared fixed point, then you want to go to the critical temperature where m squared vanishes and understand how the coupling constant behaves uh, at that uh, the temperature. And as we talked about, the coupling constant uh, lambda, it comes from the exchange of sigma between phi's. And maybe I didn't actually draw the diagram here. So in this diagram, I have two external lines for sigma. And when you stick phi lines outside on both sides, and that gives you the phi to the fourth interaction, right? And, and without this uh, determinant piece, the sigma propagator is inverse of this term. And therefore, inverse of this gives you a factor of a little lambda. And that's how you obtain the coupling constant lambda from the exchange of the sigma. But now that we have this additional piece coming from the determinant, when you exchange sigma, you need to know how sigma propagator goes with a finite momentum p. So initial sigma propagator didn't have any momentum dependence. Therefore, sigma propagator is actually a delta function in space because it's a constant in momentum space. But now that this loop diagram can depend on the momentum carried by this sigma, which corresponds to momentum transfer in the phi phi scattering amplitude, then this propagator can actually acquire momentum dependence, and therefore sigma now starts to propagate over finite distance. And that's something you need to understand. So that's how you can actually uh, uh, have this idea that the coupling constant can now depend on the physical distance between two phi particles. And in order to work this out, we need to compute this loop with a finite momentum Q for the sigma field. And that's a simple one loop uh, computation, so you know exactly what to do. So I have two propagators. One propagator has momentum P, the other one has momentum P plus Q. And you combine two propagators using this Feynman parameter integral. And by shifting P variable, you can, I can perform this P integral that gives you this gamma of one half. And this is actually a finite integral, it's a UV finite, because I have four powers downstairs and three momentum integrals. So this is actually finite and convergent. And I get this result, which depends on external momentum Q. And therefore, this sigma propagator actually has this Q dependence in it. And as I said, Q dependence means if you go back to the position space by Fourier transform, it goes over a finite distance. And depending on what distance is, you effectively measure different size of the coupling constant. <clears throat> so now that we have computed this one loop piece from this trace log, I add this one of the four lambda piece, which is constant, together with this additional piece that depends on Q for a sigma propagator and exchange it. So it looks something like this. And that gives you a, uh, uh, the coupling constant. So this sigma phi phi term gives you this vertex, which is just constant. But now you have this propagator of sigma, which depends on this momentum Q. And by sticking them together, so phi phi interaction uh, going through this sigma exchange now has an amplitude with non-trivial Q dependence. So that defines what the effective size of the coupling constant is as a function of Q or distance scale. And instead of writing Q squared to half power, uh, it's easier to write just Q. So that's meant to be the, uh, the squared momentum square root. So that's this expression here. 
And now we look at the limit what happens at very long distances, which correspond to small q. And when q is small, then this 1 over 16 q becomes large. And at some point, this becomes larger than 1 over lambda. Then you can ignore 1 over lambda. And then behavior of coupling is simply given by this minus 16 and q. And, and the having this q uh, dependence is actually what you might expect simply from dimensional analysis, because the lambda coupling in three dimension has mass dimension one. So if the system is scale invariant, which is the case here, then the only way lambda can change as a function of the distance scale or momentum scale is that it goes with a linear power with the momentum which is the inverse power of uh, 1 over r squared. So, so this is the only dependence you could possibly have when the system is scale invariant. Namely, wh when we say that you can flow to an infinite fixed point value of the coupling constant, you have to pay attention to the fact that the coupling constant lambda itself has mass dimension one. So that cannot reach a, a, a particular value what one instead would reach a particular value is the ratio of this coupling constant lambda over Q. And that ratio is dimensionless, and it will lead to a constant value. So on the next slide, I have uh, actually plotted it like this. So independent of what initial value of lambda you start out with, uh, some a particular value of Q, you get different curves but when you go to small enough q, then they all reach the same value, 8. And that's what you see analytically on this slide. So the coupling constant lambda effective as a function of q squared is what we obtained on the previous slide. So if you multiply q inverse on it, then the expression like becomes like this. And when Q is very small compared to lambda, then you can ignore the second term in parentheses, and therefore lambda times Q inverse flows to the same value 8, no matter what value of coupling constant you start out with. So that's what we mean by the infrared fixed point. So what we discussed as the Wilson-Fisher fixed point uh, in epsilon expans expansion away from 4, then the coupling constant has two epsilon dimensions, so this was not easy to see. But now in three-dimension case, coupling constant has mass dimension one, not epsilon. And whatever has mass dimension one needs to go together with Q if the system does not have any intrinsic mass scale in the problem. And indeed, lambda times Q inverse then should become a dimensionless finite number, which can become to a particular value. And that's exactly what happens here. So when you go to the scattering amplitude of phi phi at long enough distances, then that amplitude shows this behavior, that amplitude goes together with the distance scale of your measurement, and coupling becomes uh, 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 goes with the uh, Q, therefore becomes smaller and smaller as you go to longer distances. But the ratio of coupling to the distance then becomes a constant. And, and no matter what initial condition you start out with, then you flow to the same value in the infrared limit. So that's the idea of the infrared fixed point. OK, so this is uh, probably a little bit non-trivial. Are there any questions about this? Does, no questions? So, so Go ahead. does lambda, um, so lambda diverges at low momentum? Um, no, no, lambda actually goes like Q. So lambda times oh, oh, Q oh, is oh, equal yeah, to yeah, eight. Yeah, I see, I see. So lambda goes to eight times Q. Yeah, 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 okay. But so I guess, um, sorry, so when when is the, uh, so, okay, so this always this theory always flows to the IR fixed point? When m squared is zero. Oh, so, only, right, right, okay. Yeah, so when m squared is finite, it starts to show this behavior until the, the momentum scale Q of your measurement comes close to the mass scale itself. Then this running stops, then it starts running like this. 
So you never quite make it the infrared fixed point because the running would stop at the mass squared of that uh, uh, of the theory. But only in the limit where m squared is strictly zero, which corresponds to temperature being at the critical temperature, you reach this uh, infrared fixed point, and therefore theory becomes scale invariant. Therefore, correlation length is infinite, and no matter how, what resolution you look at the system, they look identical. But the meaning of system looking identical is only when you scale all the dimension full quantities according to the resolution of your measurement. And that's a definition of what do you mean by scale invariant. It's not that this dimension full coupling constant is constant. It's not constant. But dimension full coupling constant measured at a particular resolution gives you this dimensionless ratio, and that dimensionless ratio becomes constant in the infrared limit, which is strictly only the behavior when temperature is at least at the critical temperature. Okay, did you answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay, any other questions here? Because it's kind of an important point. What we mean by scale invariance? Okay, I'm not. Uh, Sorry, I have, a, um, okay. I, have, I have another question. If you go down go a couple slides to to when oh. we actually put the the one loop, um, this the one loop sigma propagator. Yeah. And, um. So so this, one? this yeah yeah so this is um. Sorry, I mean this is a very basic. Maybe question. you meant this is one. This, yeah. Well, is this actually so so previously so for sigma constant we had an exact effective action. Is this? Mm -hmm. also effective action or do we need yes this is meant to be exact up to the two point functional sigma so we only okay. computed the two external sigma lines and the trace log in principle contains arbitrary number of external sigma lines but we in order to keep the external momentum independence i do not know of a way of uh, computing in a compact fashion the arbitrary power of sigma with all the external momentum kept so instead, we are only focused on the two-point function for sigma here, so that I can keep track of uh, external momentum dependence, because that's all you need for the purpose of this phi-phi scattering amplitude. I only need to exchange sigma once, so therefore, the only thing I need is the two-point function of sigma. And for this purpose, I can keep track of the momentum dependence of, of the sigma two-point function by uh, looking at this uh, one-loop diagram. And this one-loop diagram, therefore, is an addition of the sigma-sigma piece in the 1p effective action, which depends now on this momentum. So that's the idea. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I may have to think about it and come back during the discussion, oh. but okay. Okay, all right. Good. So, so that's how we can see explicitly that, that this infrared fixed point happens in the three-dimensional theory. And again, that's a non-perturbative phenomenon. Uh, uh, the coupling constant lambda uh, times Q is eight. You know, it's certainly not a small number in any way. And, and so uh, the, you wouldn't trust perturbative calculation. But given that we have this exact result in large and limit, this is something we believe. And, and therefore, uh, uh, this infrared fixed point does exist, at least in the large end limit. And again, you can com compute the one of n expansion and then see that uh, this uh, behavior of scale invariance persists even down to a finite n. Okay. So that's what we have learned so far. So we started out near four dimension, I did excellent exponent expansion away from four dimension. And if you allow yourself to do extrapolation, you could identify this infrared fixed point at three dimension. We are not quite sure. But now we have this exact result in large and limit. And if you start from three dimension in large and limit, you do see this infrared fixed point. And you can do one of n expansion. And so here it's clear that this fixed point does persist. Then the plot thickens, namely that we seem to get at least better uh, idea that this is indeed going to the infrared fixed point. And phone is ringing. It's probably a spam. Let me stop this. Or these robot calls. I hate them. Anyway, so so that's uh, how we can approach these uh, uh, the uh, 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 realistic systems away from uh, large end limit. So the fact that both of them show the same tell the same story is making things more convincing. Now we go to the last way of approaching these systems, first going to two dimensions, 
And in two dimensions, you can write a theory called nonlinear sigma model, where you don't keep any massive degree of freedom after symmetry breaking. The only thing you keep is the massless number of Goldstone bosons. And that theory turns out to be renormalizable in two dimensions. Then you can analyze it. Then, uh, and, and I start with this corner where nonlinear sigma model is studied with the large n limit. Then I go to finite n. Uh, using perturbation theory, and do the excellent ex expansion is to move up in dimension away from two. And again, that turns out to give us the same story. So then all of this system got surrounded by the consistent idea on the perimeter of this diagram. So then you are bound to believe that these systems really do lead to the infinite fixed point and scale invariant behavior. So that is the argument uh, we are trying to make here. So now we go to two dimensions. Any idea uh, and questions about the approach? Okay, so going to two dimensions. So as I said, we only keep number Goldstone bosons uh, in two dimensions, namely that we require we are at the bottom of this wine bottle potential. So phi a phi i is strictly v squared, and it's not allowed to fluctuate. So the fluctuation of this expectation value was the massive mode, which is the same thing as the Higgs boson. But uh, it, this requiring that you are really at the bottom of the potential, in some sense, corresponds to the limit. You're making this wine bottle potential infinitely steep so that you are stuck at the bottom of this wine bottle potential. So, so that gives you this constraint that phi i phi i is v squared. So basically, we're asking the question, we are presuming the symmetry does break, at least locally. And then we are trying to understand the question, what happens at long distances, even though symmetry is spontaneously broken locally, whether symmetry gets restored at long distance or not. And this is the kind of intuition we learned from this large end limit analysis, as, as uh, I explained just a, a couple of minutes ago. So then your Lagrangian can be written like this. So this sigma field, is now a Lagrange multiplier instead of auxiliary field. So Lagrange multiplier uh, forces this phi i phi i minus v squared vanishing as a constraint. And uh, this theory turns out to be renormalizable at two dimensions. And again, we compute this uh, 1p effective action for sigma and phi in the large n limit. And again, we know exactly what to do. So as long as sigma is space time constant, then this sigma is coupled to phi phi, and therefore we can compute the phi loop in the presence of sigma, and we know exactly what that is for a space, space time constant sigma, and there we go. And this is again meant to be the exact result in the large n limit. And you can go through the same kind of power counting argument in the powers of n for vertices and propagated and so on, and convince yourself that this is indeed the exact result in the large n limit. So then we can go ahead and analyze it. So, so we have this uh, renormalizable theory. And the one thing I did not mention is that what I mean by renormalizable uh, uh, from the point of view of perturbation theory. So if you place this constraint, in principle, you can go ahead and solve this constraint and write phi n uh, in terms of all the other phi's up from uh, one to n, mi n minus one. It's just solving the constraint. And you can stick it back into the first term in, in Lagrangian. So all the first n minus one case are just standard massless uh, uh, Klein-Gordon field. But for the nth uh, kinetic term, I need to stick in the square root. So this piece here now becomes non-trivial. And it, it turns out that you can actually expand this denominator uh, as one minus one over v squared times phi phi in power series in one over v squared. Therefore, one over v squared actually acts as the coupling constant in this theory. And, and in two dimensions, that's dimensionless because the phi field uh, is also dimensionless. Remember, the mass dimension of phi is d minus two over two. And when d is two, that's zero. So phi is dimensionless. Therefore, v is also dimensionless. And one over v squared now acts as the coupling constant if you develop perturbation theory with it. So it turns out that this is actually a renormalizable field theory. So uh, going back to the large n limit, we now have this additional piece coming from the determinant. And uh, so effective potential then is this piece here plus this additional piece. Uh, uh, then I expand this around two dimensions. 
as usual. And uh, in two minus two epsilon dimension, I get this one of epsilon pole, which is linear in sigma. We do have a piece linear in sigma. So this pole then is renormalized into the definition of V squared. And then you find there's no solution with uh, the vanishing sigma. So once again, when you look at the stationary condition with respect to phi, then phi derivative of gamma tells you sigma phi must vanish. So in order for phi to have expectation value, sigma has to vanish. But looking at this uh, effective potential and stationary condition, then again, we have this log of sigma, which diverges logarithmically when sigma goes to zero. So it turns out that this doesn't have any solution with vanishing sigma, therefore phi cannot turn on. So if phi doesn't turn on, then this actually gives you a solution to sigma now, which looks like this. And again, you see this exponential behavior, e to the minus four pi v squared. And remember, v squared was supposed to be one over coupling. So this is the same kind of essential singularity we have seen before, <coughs> namely that the behavior of now the mass of phi, which is the expectation value of sigma, I'm sorry, mass of the phi squared, it's typo, expected value of sigma uh, goes like e to the minus uh, one of a cap coupling constant, which you can never see in any powers in the power series expansion in lambda. Uh, at the same time, uh, now that we trust this result as an exact result in large n limit, you find that the mass squared of phi uh, comes out to be exponentially suppressed relative to the original scale of the problem. And that's, again, you see the emergence of this long correlation length at a hierarchically exponentially small uh, mass scale compared to the fundamental scale of physics, like atomic scale. So uh, we see the same behavior as we have confirmed in the large in, uh, we have confirmed with the linear sigma model, namely that the correlation length is finite. Therefore, there's no massless number of Goldstone bosons anymore. Phi acquires a mass. But the mass of the phi is exponentially small compared to the original mass scale of the problem. So this is what is actually called dimensional transmutation, because this is actually rather surprising if you think about it. So in the classical Lagrangian, I told you that V is dimensionless. And there are no other parameters in this theory. The only dimension, uh, only prominent in theory, which is dimensionless, therefore, this classical Lagrangian is actually scale invariant already from the onset. But it ended up developing a finite mass scale. So how come the Lagrangian that doesn't know anything about dimension full scale generates a particular mass scale at the end of the day? Is this idea called dimensional transmutation? So we use this renormalization scale mu, but we could have done exactly the same calculation with the UV cutoff. Then the mass of phi squared against the typo should go like lambda squared with this exponential suppression factor. So generated scale is exponentially smaller. So that's the idea of dimensional transmutation. And the way you can understand this from the point of view of renormalization group equation is this plot. So we have this effective potential. And going back to this argument of kalan zimancic equation, that effective potential should not depend on mu. Therefore, mu dependence, explicit mu dependence from this one loop piece should be canceled by implicit mu dependence of this coupling V squared. And that gives you this equation. And because one over V squared is a coupling constant, I rewrite it for the one of V squared. And the solution is actually this. So V squared at energy scale mu actually decreases from V squared at some initial condition mu naught in a logarithmic fashion. And coupling constant is inverse of this. So if the coupling squared decreases logarithmically as a function of energy scale, at some point, this coupling square, uh, V squared becomes zero which means coupling constant, which is one over V squared, goes to infinite. Therefore, the coupling constant has this behavior that it starts out with some initial value, but it starts to increase 
as you go to a, uh, uh, a smaller energy scales or longer distances, and at some point it blows up. And the energy scale where this blows up, if you actually look at the zero of this denominator, is nothing but the mass of this phi generated right here in this expression. So the emergence of this mass scale in a theory which doesn't have any dimensionless const dimension for constant is now understandable in the following way. So even though we have a theory at the classical level which doesn't have any dimension for constant, that classical theory is meant to be defined with certain energy scale because we have already integrated out all the physics of modes with a higher momenta. So your classical Lagrangian is already quantum in the sense that includes all the effects at shorter distances. And then coupling constant defined at that energy scale starts to run to longer and longer distances, smaller and smaller energy scales, and at some point that blows up. And therefore it generates a finite mass scale in the problem at the end of the day. So this is what is said to be dimensional transmutation because what used to be dimensionless theory now makes a transmutation to a theory with the, uh, the a theory with uh, uh, explicit mass scale in the problem and hence dimensional transmutation. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is that this is exactly the same behavior as what we see in the theory of strong interaction in the standard model. QCD, quantum chronoline dynamics, and we start talking about this a theory based on non orbit gauge theory uh, after spring break. And uh, uh, it's a good approximation to assume that all particles in theory are massless to begin with. And so that's a similar theory as nonlinear sigma model in two dimension we are studying here. So classically, theory doesn't have any intrinsic scale in scale invariant, but the coupling constant in this theory does de increase as you go to lower energies and then blows up at some finite energy scale. And the energy scale where the coupling constant blows up generates a mass scale, which turns out to be actually mass of the proton and neutron in our body. So when you actually uh, uh, put yourself on a scale and measure your weight, what you're actually measuring is the energy scale where the QCD coupling constant is blowing up. And that's a dominant contribution to your weight, right? So, so the, uh, your weight is a consequence of dimensional transmutation. And so that's the idea of this uh, 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 way of understanding this behavior uh, using the realization group equation argument. So let me back up and then and see if there are any questions. So, so we did look at this uh, nonlinear sigma model in two dimension. In the large end limit, we could work out this uh, mass of the phi are generated in this exponential plus fashion. And in order to actually extend this understanding for the finite n, I wanted to recast this argument now using this, uh, 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 based on this memorization group equation. And now we came to this understanding that this generation of the mass scale has to do with the fact that the coupling constant in the theory becomes larger at longer distances and lower momentum scale and eventually blows up and that is how the finite mass scale is generated in an exponentially small way relative to the original uh, energy scale of the problem. And this behavior is called asymptotic freedom because the coupling becomes smaller and theory becomes free in asymptotically high energy scale or short distances. On the other hand, if you go to infrared, this is said to be infrared slavery uh, and, and, and the uh, the phi field, it turns out, uh, is, is actually a, uh, a, a sort of uh, enslaved by the cloud of the interaction, which make it massive. So that's the idea of uh, 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 the dimensional transmutation. So any questions about this? This is, again, kind of important point. Um, so in this, um, so, so to actually predict the scale at which this blows up, in this theory you would need a measurement of of new you know new to the minus two at some mu naught bigger mm -hmm. at a higher right. energy right that's right 
So what, what plays the role of that measurement for the mass of the proton prediction? Yeah, so for the case of mass of the proton, you can measure the strength of the interaction among quarks and gluons at high energy colliders like LHC. And there you smashing protons against protons, but inside the proton you find actually quarks and gluons uh, in there. And then all the jets coming out from this collision are supposed to be the result of interaction among the quarks and gluons inside the proton against each other. So you can measure the size of the coupling constant that way. Okay. And that is actually small. So uh, what, one precise measurement was done in experiment, prior experiment called LEP. You produce E plus E minus collision, producing a Z boson that decays into these jets. And at the energy scale of Z boson mass, that's 91 GeV, the what corresponds to fine structure constant is something like 0.12. So it's not as small as 1 mod of 137, but 0.12 is small enough that you can trust perturbation theory. And so that's the extracted coupling constant. But you can also measure the same coupling constant at low energies, for example, from tau decay. And tau is some, it, has, it has a mass of 1.777 GeV. And their coupling constant is almost like 0.2. So you can really see the coupling constant grows at lower energies. And then if you put those numbers on a curve, which you can compute theoretically, then you can predict where the coupling constant blows up. And that energy scale turns out to be about 0.3 GeV. And so that's how we believe that quark, which is basically massless for uh, 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 all practical purposes, now acquires a mass of 0.3 GeV as a result of this blowing up coupling constant. And proton is supposed to have three of them inside. So 0.3 GeV times three is about GeV, and that's exactly what the mass of the proton is. So that's how we understand that coupling constant at high energy setting initial condition, which then predicts where the, uh, what, what, what energy scale the coupling constant would blow up. And that blowing up coupling constant sets the energy scale of the problem, which then induces the mass of the, the constituents, in this case quark, and that is the explanation of how the mass of the proton arises at the GeV energy scale. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, and at some point I should be able to show how the coupling constant runs, uh, and uh, I, I, I tried to create a slide on that. Anyway, so that's the idea. Any other questions about this? Good. But now that we have this uh, renormalization group equation, we can go slightly away from two dimensions and, and then uh, understand how the system behaves. So again, strictly at two dimensions, you can first do the computation with finite n using the perturbation theory at, uh, at one loop level. The only change is that the beta function uh, of the running coupling constant goes like n minus two over n. So this used to be one in the large n limit. Now it changes to n minus two over n. So this vanishes when n equal two, which actually makes sense because when n is two, that's the xy model you're looking at in the homework problem. And that's exactly the same thing as massless, a uh, free massless scalar boson. So there's no interaction, therefore no coupling constant and therefore no beta function. So n equal two is special because of that. But for finite n larger than two, then you still do have this beta function with a negative coefficient. So for a finite n, that you expect this behavior, the beta function is negative. Therefore, if you go to ultraviolet, coupling constant decreases, and that's the asymptotic freedom. But when, when you go to infrared, coupling constant increases, and, and then that leads to this blowing up behavior. So that's how you extend what we have learned in large n limit now to finite n. And then you can deviate from two dimensions. Oops, I'm sorry. So uh, away from two dimensions, then the coupling constant one over V squared now acquires the two epsilon dimension. So beta function has the additional piece two epsilon G together with this negative piece. So that again tells you that uh, a beta function has a zero. And uh, do you see the plot of the beta function? On my screen, actually it overlaps together with the, uh, uh, the control bar. Is it yeah, okay? Yeah, we can yeah. see it. Okay, good, good. So now you see a zero here, I hope. 
So when you go to UV, then you approach, no matter what initial condition is, to this fixed point value. So this is actually a UV fixed point instead of IR fixed point. And away from two dimensions, this coupling constant uh, is, can be interpreted to be actually temperature. So uh, there's another way of writing down the same Lagrangian by scaling phi to V phi. Then V squared appears up front in the Lagrangian together with N. And therefore, V squared basically corresponds to beta of E to the minus beta Hamiltonian of the Boltzmann factor. Therefore, one over V squared as a coupling constant corresponds to temperature. So this fixed point value of the coupling constant therefore corresponds to the critical temperature. And when temperature is above the critical temperature, then G is smaller than this critical coupling, and an infrared it flows to zero. Uh, no, no, I said the other way around. So when the temperature is above TC, coupling is, I'm sorry, above the critical coupling, therefore it falls to larger coupling infrared, coupling blows up, and therefore it actually restores the symmetry. Even though we started out with the theory of the only number goes on bosons with broken symmetry, system restores its symmetry above the critical temperature. On the other hand, below the critical temperature, coupling flows to zero in the infrared, and therefore, theory becomes a theory of a bunch of free, massless, Lambda-Goldstone bosons. So again, we lead to the same picture of what's going on uh, uh, in, in this diagram. So uh, let me conclude the discussion today. So we looked at this uh, ND diagram, and we approached these uh, the three points of the realistic system from all directions. And all of these approaches gave us the same picture, namely that there is a very non-trivial fixed point in the theory, where theory becomes scale invariant. And when the temperature is above the critical temperature, then system is symmetric. When the temperature is below the critical temperature, then system has the spontaneous symmetry breaking. And exactly at the critical temperature, we have this weird scale invariant theory where critical exponents can be quite different from what you naively expect from Nando theory. So all of these approaches end up giving us the same picture, at least quantitatively. So what remains to be discussed is, are there any ways of really quantitatively approach these various systems directly? Anyway, so that's the end of discussion for today. Any questions? Sorry, I went over a couple of minutes. Right, so we do have the discussion section at five o'clock anyway. So having listened to my lecture today, I hope you send me emails, you know, what questions you might want to ask beforehand so that I can prepare a few slides on this. And you can also request some totally different material uh, uh, if you want to have the covered discussion section. So if I have time to prepare for them, I, I'd be happy to do so. So do email me about what you'd like to hear about a discussion section. So uh, uh, that's it for now. So. I hope you have a, a good spring break, despite all these restrictions imposed on us. All right. One quick question, one logistic question. Um, yes, go ahead. After spring break, we're going to start on the gauge theory section. That's right, yeah. So the, this basically concludes part two of the Peskin Schroeder, and we move to part three. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I see you later today. Thank you.